All right, hello everyone and welcome to Traffic Corner Tuesday. My name is Nancy Crow, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing for SPAC Consulting and I'll be your host for today's session. All right, everyone, <laughs> as we're flipping through our slides here, I just want to remind everybody for a couple housekeeping uh, pieces for today's webinar. Um, to listen to your webinar today, just use your computer, your mobile device. There is no call-in number needed to participate. And please ask questions throughout the webinar. I'll be watching the uh, inquiries as people are asking questions and um, interrupting our, our host today to answer those questions. So feel free to join the conversation. Today's session is brought to you by uh, SPAC Consulting and SPAC Enterprises. Um, SPAC Enterprise consists of a group of six traffic engineering companies focused on providing products and services that improve transportation globally. Our companies provide traffic consulting services, traffic data collection products and services, and free trip generation data. You can learn more about all of our products and our services on the Mike on Traffic blog. Also, I want to remind everyone that we have already released our upcoming uh, Traffic Corner Tuesdays. Of course, you're at the April event, which is the unwarranted stop sign research. But coming up in May, uh, we will be talking about the six ways that you can discredit a traffic study. And in June, we will be dealing with citizens' requests. So I hope you can join us and we'll tell you how to register at the end of the session. Finally, I want to remind everybody that um, today we do have a special bonus for all of our attendees. We will be sharing our stop sign compliance research study and uh, stick around to the end and Bryant and Mike will share with you how you can get a copy of the study as well. All right, finally, I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Joining us today is Mike Spac. He is the president of Spac Consulting and he is the recognized authority on traffic studies. He is a graduate of the University of Minnesota, past president of the North Central section of the Institute of Transportation Engineers, and he is also a fellow of the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Since 1996, Mike has led over a thousand traffic engineering projects. During the past two decades, Mike has founded four companies, including SPAC Consulting. And he's also the creative force and principal writer of the industry leading blog, Mike on Traffic. Also joining me today is Bryant Fiesek. He is the Vice President of SPAC Consulting and he is also widely known in the transportation industry. He has managed more than 1,000 traffic engineering projects. He is also a graduate of the University of Minnesota and he is an expert in synchro, sim traffic, vstro, and vsim traffic modeling software packages. Bryant thrives on developing creative solutions for traffic and transportation issues and he enjoys writing case studies about unique projects for Mike on Traffic. Please join me in welcoming Mike and Brian. Thanks, Nancy. All right, thank you. Let's dive right in. We got a lot of things to show you today. And so, <laughs> oof, skipped right over it. So the first thing we wanted to get to is just, what are we talking about today? What is this uh, stop sign research that we're looking at, Dan? previewed it there, put a picture, a couple beers, a lot of, uh, a lot of our research seems to start at a bar and <laughs> talking with other people just on different things that, uh, gripes, complaints, whatever it might be. While this one was not at a bar, it was still talking about what we do, dealing with city councils, that sort of thing. And it came up in talking, uh, in this case with the city of Victoria about how, when they go in front of councils, they're, they're requesting stop signs. And one of the things we reply is always, don't put stop signs in in unwarranted places. They breed disrespect for sign, for other signs. It's just, it's not a good situation. And uh, we say that a lot, but we don't actually have the proof on it. And so that's kind of the origin of how we got to this particular yeah, research This project. is an origin story of the city engineer asking Bryant, Hey, we all say this a lot, but help me back it up. And uh, hopefully that gets your wheels spinning too, as, uh, as you're listening to this. If there are other kind of unfounded assumptions, uh, please type them in the comments and uh, we're always looking for research ideas. But of course this one, then we went to Google and to ITE and uh, to other places and tried to research, could we come up with data on 
on stop signs and kind of the compliance around them to kind of back up uh, the city of Victoria request and we couldn't find any data. So uh, thus a little research project was born. Yep. And so right along that, looking for other things, first thing we consult is the MUTCD. So we have right from the MUTCD, this is all the stuff about stop signs, installation. You don't have to read this. Most people are familiar with it. Uh, luckily, we summarized it for you. So here's the guidelines generally for stop signs and installing those stop signs, what you want to pay attention to. Yeah, so there are really four criteria for putting in sideway side street stop signs and uh the first one being functional classification if you have a minor street coming up against a collector an arterial uh a local roadway that's uh, one criteria mm -hmm. next one is volume this can be the total entering volume it can include pedestrians and bicyclists and uh, the one criteria they have is over daily that's, so that's a good one to look at yeah, is that 2,000 vehicles? 2,000 vehicles per day. Per day. Well, 2,000 units per day. So some combination of vehicles, peds, and bikes. Yep. And then third, uh, if you have sight distance problems, if there's a big pine tree or a big retaining wall on the corner that blocks people from being able to see around the corner, uh, you need to stop them. So then they come to a legal stop and then creep out until they can see around that obstacle. And hopefully you have sight distance once they creep out safely towards the intersection, but not yes. into the intersection. Yes. Otherwise you have to fix that sight distance problem. <laughs> Fourth one, safety crash records. So this is a reactive look at it. If you have a certain number of crashes, stop signs can be installed in that instance as a way to correct that. Yeah, and it's a middle ground. I think it's three correctable. Somebody can correct me. I'm and wrong. Four or three. five, I think, depending on the Yeah, volume. it's it's less so. than the traffic signal warrant. Yes, though. yep. And then last, which is what uh, we're always talking about in front of city councils, is put in stop sides for speed control and traffic calming. But the MUTCD specifically says we should not put them in. Yep for speed control or traffic calming. Yep, the exact quote is yield or stop signs should not be used for speed control. So it's used a lot that way, it shouldn't be. Yeah, that flies in the <laughs> face of the whole basket weave concept that was popular about 25 years yeah. ago. All right, so with that background, we know some things about stop signs. We know we don't have anything on compliance right now. We've discovered this is a research project we want to undertake. So we had to come through with what are the steps? What are we looking at in order to accomplish this goal? Yeah, and this started out with the city of Victoria city engineer saying, hey, I would love to be part of this. And can we come up with a little bit of something? And, yep. and then uh, the way our minds work here is, why uh, just stop there? Let's see if we can make this a bigger project, more statistically significant and bring in more partners. Um, so we open it up to a lot of you who are listening are aware of our efforts, but uh, yeah, starting out, we started with the city of Victoria, kind of pinning down what is the issue and the goal. Mm -hmm. And in this case, what we were looking for is a correlation between the intersection characteristics, whether it's volume, functional classification, kind of going back to the MUTCD and those guidelines, can we can we find a correlation between those characteristics and compliance? Where are those lines drawn? Second one, just now that we have a goal, how do we define success? In this case, it's just finding that correlation. So hopefully the data we get gives us some clear guidance or at least some uh, rules of thumb, so to speak, of, of how to look at these situations. Back up when we go to a council to say, no, this is not a good idea, or yeah, it, it would work in this situation. Yep. And then, of course, once we define success, then it's just going through and detailing out a process uh, that we're going towards, and that's partnering with cities, getting out there with count cam video cameras, recording intersections, watching the video, 
to determine if people are stopping or not, and then aggregating all that data is in a nutshell the process, which sounds easy, but <laughs> thank you to Haley, uh, our, our fresh EIT out of school who uh, got to watch lots of videos and crunch lots of numbers <laughs> on this. Um, I'm not gonna quite say it was hazing, but uh, I, uh, I'm very happy that she's through that now. <laughs> and so is she. At least we, until we get to phase two. <laughs> Uh, and then lastly, obviously complete the study. Now we've got all the parameters, complete the study, get through the process. What are our findings? What, what's the end result? Did we meet our success? All right. So going through that, we started out with some site selection. Like we said, we started with city of Victoria. We talked with other partner cities quickly expanded out. And in this case, we grabbed a total of eight Minnesota cities. So thank you to cities of Chaska, Edina, Hastings, Maple Grove, Roseville, St. Louis Park, Victoria, and Woodbury. They all signed up right away. And then also one from North Carolina, city of Wilmington. So yeah. again, thank you to all those for uh, signing up, working with us on this project. Yeah, thank you. Each of these cities, uh, gave us a little bit of money to help us cover the field work. So this wasn't exactly a fully volunteer effort like we do with trip generation, but uh, collecting that local data for the cities, then they have a little bit more skin in the game when they go to the city council and give them the broad statistics, but also say our local statistics mm -hmm. match up with this. Um, and uh, as some of you have seen, we are opening this up to a phase two, phase three with other cities to partner. Uh, the more data, the better, as we'll get through the rest of the presentation. Yep. So for each of these nine cities, we identified four intersections with them. And at each intersection, we're looking at a single approach. Um, we didn't have many guidelines for this initial one. So cities were free to choose different different ones, different characteristics. As we get into phase two, like Mike talked about, we may have some more guidance as we try to fill in gaps for what we have, but we ended up with 36 different approaches that we were checking for compliance at. All right, so with that, we move on to data collection. So we originally started this project in the fall. I was August-ish, September, we were thinking we were going to do a quick gathering, we'd get our sites, we'd go out there, we'd get everything we need, and we'd quickly wrap this up. Um, did not work out that way. So first this happened. <laughs> and then this happened. And then this happened. <laughs> and uh, for those of you listening who are in Minnesota, we were finally almost uh, without snow on the ground. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, so obviously we wanted to collect data when weather conditions were normal. Um, so we had to wait for very clear weeks to when we collected the data. Um, so that slowed us down. Yep. We had to make sure the pavement was clean. Like this last photo here with the high snow banks, we had to make sure some of that either got taken away or melted away so that the sidelines were what they should be. So Weather interfered with us uh, more than once as we try to go through this process. Eventually, though, this is a shot from our count cam at the on intersection as part of the study. So we were able to get our cameras in there. We, from this angle, we were able to capture all the movements, do our counts, get all the turning movements, count vehicles, pets, any bikes, brave souls who might have been out during the cold. And for this one, we were looking at that southbound direction. So we had a clear view of vehicles coming up to the stop sign and we could determine what they were doing. So let's move into determining compliance. So how did we determine that? So this is just another intersection as part of it. Take a look at it here. This is the full stop. And I, see. and I think it doesn't take a uh, professional engineering license to determine that that car fully stopped there. Yep. You so. could kind of count. There was just the quick beat. Car didn't move. It was done. So pretty easy there. Okay. 
And, li and likewise, this also doesn't take a PE to determine that, uh, yeah, that car blew through the stop sign. Yeah. No stop. No brakes. They just went right through. And then we hit this middle ground. And this is a good example of one where we sometimes have to make judgment calls. They slowed down. They came close to a stop. But we did not consider that a full stop. They they rolled through it, so to speak. The wheels never stopped. Yeah, based on my talks eons ago when I was in the Maple City of Maple Grove, a police officer could have pulled them over and probably would have given them a warning. Probably wouldn't have given them a ticket, but yeah, they did not come to a complete stop. So that is the data, or those are the videos that we looked through trying to make those three categories, full stop, no stop, rolling stop. And that's what we based then our, our data on. So we start moving finally into the numbers now. Here's what we got overall. Yeah, so we have about two thirds of the people come to a rolling stop and about a quarter of them come to a full stop and alarmingly, uh, through our whole data set, 11% of people don't stop. And uh, that is the terrifying one mm -hmm. of you teach a child that people stop at stop signs and they start crossing the street without the judgment and that's bad things happen. Mm -hmm. Another interesting, just on the range of percentages, our no stop, we did have an intersection that got all the way up to 53% of the traffic did not stop at the stop sign. I mean, which is just incredible to me, but also says, um, why is that stop sign there? Right. And uh, we should note that, so we collected data at 36 approaches that had stop signs. And each one of those approaches, we did the stop, no stop, rolling stop for one peak hour and one non-peak hour. Mm -hmm. So we did the full turning movement counts and then identified a peak and a non-peak hour um, to see uh, based on volumes what the differences are. Uh, we do have a question from Stephanie. She was asking, was the 53% at a two-way stop? Yes. Yes. Thank you. All right. So moving on with some other statistics then so we took a look at the data we tried to put it in again relating back to the mutcd functional classification so we got two bar charts here the one on the left is on the approach so what on the approach that we looked at what is that classification of that road and then the one on the right is for the conflicting road what is the classification of the one you are stopping at and then moving on with your turn so what we found and you can if we just start on the left if we look at the approaches let me see if i can get my highlighter laser pointer so if we start we've got a local road compliance about 25 percent full stop um red yellow green if you didn't notice for <laughs> full stop rolling and no stop uh, when we get to a collector road, that jumps up to about 30, and then it jumps up again. So as we move up on the classification, we have better compliance, and conversely, the no stop goes down slightly. Similarly, for the conflicting classification, that compliance jumps up quite a bit, and the no stop goes down. So. And that's intuitive. And as we flip into the volumes that you'd expect as the classification goes from local up to collector, up to arterial, we're going to see more volumes and there's more of that situational reason to stop. Correct. Now just, yeah, be clear that just because you decide to call something a collector, you probably won't see these results, but if you have the characteristics of a collector, you should have right. higher if, compliance. Yeah, if the roadway width is more suitable to the collector, if the volumes are there, but just calling a cul-de-sac with five homes on it an arterial isn't yeah, going to do anything. Isn't gonna do anything. All right, so let's move on here as we go to maybe.
There, there it is. All right, so daily volume, we mentioned from the MUTCB, the 2000 mark at about 2000 is what they had pegged at the volume or the units that they wanted to install that. So we took a look at the data that way. And again, you can see just a clear divide between the two. Once we got over that 2000, compliance jumped up over 10%. The non-compliance went down from about 20 to about five. So, but I'd like to note, so that that's clear. And uh, this data set, what we're talking about today is we had some always stop signs and yes. side street stop signs. And this is the aggregate data set and we'll be slicing and dicing further in the report. Um, but I want to point out that 62% of people are coming to a rolling stop under all scenarios. Um, mm -hmm. And that's consistent. So uh, as we'll be getting into, this should lead the discussion towards roundabouts or traffic circles or yield signs. Um, but we'll talk more at the end about that. So Michael has a question regarding um, the rolling stop. He asked, why is a rolling stop considered a stop at all? As someone who has been hit by a car rolling, it is sure wasn't a stop when I was riding, uh, was I right, when I was riding the bumper. Sure, sure, yeah, uh, I don't disagree with that, that this is the gray area. So you certainly could paint the picture that only 19% of people are stopping if it's less than 2000 cars a day and we get a third of people stopping if it's more than 2000. Yeah. Yeah. So from yeah. that lens, these are an epic fail. Yeah, that's probably a good way to look at it. Uh, so taking the daily volume, a different step, we get the uh, scatter shot here, all the different points of data we've got. Again, the green is the no stop, uh, yellow rolling, red full stop. And what's interesting here is as the volume goes up. And these are um, the entering volume of vehicles, peds and bikes. Yep, yep. So as the volume goes up, as you would expect, that compliance gets higher. And what we were seeing right in this area, so a little below the 2000, depending on how we slice it, um, that's where we started to see a jump in compliance. Right, so uh, we need to dig into the data a lot further to pin this down, but a rule of thumb could be somewhere around 1500 vehicles a day, not 2000 vehicles a day, maybe a more rational break point. So following the daily, we sliced it down to our hourly volumes and we did this a couple different ways so the first one is just looking at the approach volume so how many cars were coming up to that stop sign and then how many of them stopped or didn't stop and and again we see a clear line that right around 60 vehicles at the approach uh, less than that there's a lot less compliance mm -hmm. And I do have one more question here. Albert asks why there are any correlations for compliance of warranted by the MUTCD stop signs versus unwarranted stop signs. Was there any correlation for the compliance of warranted stop signs versus unwarranted stop signs? And that's and that's what we're finding. If I go back a couple steps here to the daily. So this is that 2000 mark from the MUTCB, we found it might actually be a little less than 2000, but there is a line there right around the MUTCB where compliance starts to increase. So if we look at warranted, we would expect higher compliance than the unwarranted according to the MUTCB. So okay. we're so far, and we don't have those numbers, but we're, we're coming into roughly a green with the MUTCB. Okay, and then Joseph also asked, are there sample, are these samples for urban roads with speeds of 30 miles an hour or less? We'll get into we'll that. We'll get to that. Okay. And then there was one last question regarding the R value seems so low yep. that there doesn't seem to actually be a pattern. That could certainly make the case um, that I wouldn't use this best fit line, but I think the trends are there as kind of the pass fail line around 2000. And those um, were put in just to indicate the direction. Those are linear tread lines. If we changed okay. it to a power logarithmic, something like that. Um, and this one shows it in particular. 
I mean, this part of it is pretty flat, but then as you get down to these lower volumes, it, okay. it increases. If I'm just looking at the green dots there. Okay. So we have about five minutes left. So let's hold questions till the end for those who want to stay on and let's uh, motor through the last few slides. All right. So we're on hourly volumes here. This was approach. We did the same with conflicting. And this one, it's about 100 where we started seeing that break right around there. But again, the same thing, lower volume, less compliance, somewhat intuitive, but we're identifying actual levels of where that break occurs. Next one we did was trying to find that product of approach versus conflicting. And this is somewhat skewed because of the large scale we've got at the bottom. But the real thing to look at is right down on this end, all of a sudden, the, the non-compliance or the full uh, or the, the no stops is right around 10, 15%. And then somewhere down here, that product just, it just skyrockets. So this is another one where I think we'll be able to find a number and provide some guidance to say, if, you're, if your cross product does not hit this, what are you doing? Why are you putting that out there? So even though the R squared values of the trend lines obviously are not st statistically significant, we think each of these logarith logarithmic or exponential curves, we're finding that we think there is a clear delineation in the data set that yeah. says above this, these thresholds, we have better compliance and below we have much worse. All right, so here's the speeds. Again, we're starting to get to the end, so we want to run through this quickly, but we've got it both on the approach and the conflicting, and you can see if we look at our full stop, it goes down and jumps back up, Just and that's on the leg that's stopping, but if we look at the conflicting, it's right hovering right around 30%. Doesn't matter what the speed is that you're coming into. So this makes us, leads us to think that this backs up the notion that stop signs are not speed control devices. That yep. no matter what the speeds are of the approach or the cross streets, uh, does not seem to lead to compliance. So if we get to our initial thoughts and of the results, like Mike just said, no correlation with speed. It, it just, it doesn't seem to matter what that posted speed limit is. People are looking at other factors. The classification matters. This is assuming that your functional classification is valid and yeah, um, the road physically matches up with the classification. Yep. yep. Higher volumes equal higher compliance. So that's again, intuitive, but um, that's what you should be looking at. That might be a key factor as to what to look at as those volumes. And then number four, just we're horrible at full stops. I mean, just all the drivers we looked at, as we pointed out with some of those statistics, two thirds of the people are rolling through stop signs. Yeah, and I mean, when if you had put something out there and it only worked 20 to 25% of the time, no matter what your industry was, I think you would look at iterating a better solution, I, I think is the real yeah. answer here. Yep. So that leads us to one, confirm that the MUTCD, the, the criteria there appears valid, but also should we be moving to not signing intersections, using yields more or using roundabouts more? Right. If people that, aren't complying with them. Yeah, if that was a yield sign, all of a sudden we have 80, 80 to 90% compliance to a yield sign. So why we're using the wrong sign if that's the behavior we are willing to accept. All right, so next steps, we do have some spinning on the numbers. We got to parse some things out, but really try to identify the guidelines that we're seeing for those volumes, whether it's daily or hourly or some combination, and then put that into a report. All our participating cities will get the chance to review it. We'll also have some individual statistics for them to look at. And then we will finalize that report in mid-May and make that available widely for others. 
After that, that's where we wanna move into our phase two and phase three. So gathering more cities, we wanna add a crash analysis to this. What, what does it look like if we look at the historic crashes and then also do flashing stop signs make a difference? Yeah, and, the, the LED, yep. the ones with the LED borders. Um, and also, even though yield signs are rare, it'd be interesting to find out if they have the same 90, and do they have the 90% compliance to yield signs um, could lead us towards, hopefully all of this phase two and phase three will lead us to giving you much more clear guidance on what works and what doesn't. All right, so we're just after one o'clock, so we've hit our time. So just a quick thank you to everybody who stayed with us we do have that bonus the report is not ready yet we're anticipating that mid-may once we get through some stuff so you're able to sign up for that uh you're also able to email us um, let us know if you want to participate if you haven't already some of you have identified you want to help uh, for the phase two and phase three but please let us know for that and then also just a quick thank you but we will stay on so if there are other questions, we're happy to, to continue talking, continue to answer them, but we just wanna make sure we say thanks for those who have to leave. Um, and we hope we will see you next month as well. So we do have a couple um, questions from our attendees today. Uh, one of the questions from Robert, he said that he enjoyed the presentation today and um, while it might be a little extra work, he would really love to see uh, site distance versus compliance. And he wanted to know if you guys had any additional thoughts on that. We did. Uh, I didn't have enough ready for this presentation, but we did track site distance. And what we were looking at is the site triangle. So what we were trying to figure out is if you had enough site distance, the criteria for an unsigned intersection does that make a difference? So if you have lots of site distance available, basically, does that lead to less compliance? And so my, my assumption would be that it does, um, but that's one of the spinning we have yet to do on it. So that'll be in the report coming out in a few weeks. Okay. There was also a question from Mark. He asked, can you make any inference in your results to four-way stop sign compliance? We have that information. I. I don't have that answer right now. This was an aggregate for this purpose. Um, but again, that'll be something we'll split out in the report. So that will be forthcoming. Okay. Um, he also, uh, Andrew asked, functional classification of intersecting roads, site distance, volume, speeds, they're all key factors. Is that true thoughts on that? Speed did not seem to be a key factor. No. And we haven't sliced it by site distance yet. So the two that seem to be correlated are functional classification and mm -hmm. the volumes, mm -hmm. but one could all, it's intuitive to say the volumes come with the classification that if you had a really wide road with no volumes on it, it probably would have lower compliance, but the report will hash into yeah. that. So it may shake out that it's just that cross product <laughs> of the volumes is the most important factor of the approach volumes against the crossing volumes. Mm -hmm. um, Chris also wanted to know if you have any thoughts or information on what happens to accident rates when an unwarranted stop sign is implemented. We're that's part of phase two, phase three that we want to have later on crash analysis on this. The tough part with pedestrian crashes or crashes within neighborhoods are it, they're such rare events that it we could end up <laughs> with the 36 approaches that we've studied it could turn out we have no crashes at any of them right. um so crash rates are a tough thing to get at at this kind of study um because they're rare events and they have to be reported so it's possible there have been crashes at it or minor fender benders that we will never know about so we will take a look but um we'll, we'll just have to wait and see what yeah it says. we'll have to see what the data says um, michael was wondering if any of the intersections that you guys explored um with stop signs had a bike left turn turning boxes anything with bikes and no 
these are mainly most of them were local the approaches at least were local with a few uh collectors thrown in um yeah no no turn boxes or anything that some of them were even unstriped without anything so this was uh, yeah this is much more within neighborhoods not on the edges of neighborhoods is that yeah it's a fair characteristic so and we wouldn't expect to see bike boxes in the middle of a residential neighborhood okay all right well uh, that concludes all of the questions that we have here and i want to thank everybody for joining us i know a couple people had some issues with their audio but it looks like that has been mostly resolved uh, just a quick note for our attendees that tomorrow we will be sending out a copy of the video so that you can uh, Take a step back, sit down with a cup of coffee, and review what was discussed today. If you have any uh, questions, of course, our contact information is in there as well, and feel free to reach out to us. Again, if you're interested in receiving the stop sign compliance research study, we will be sending it out in mid-May. You feel free to text us at 44222 and use the code stop sign study, or drop us an email, and we will be sure to add you to the list so you get a copy of the study when it's available. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.